If you grab your Bibles and stand with me, please, if you can. We're working our way through the Bible verse by verse. We're up to Acts chapter 5, verse 1 this morning. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife, also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? It was. And offer it was and after it was sold, excuse me, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, I would think. The young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and said, what's going on in here? <laughs> and carried her out and buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest dared join them, the non-believers. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Wow, what a scripture. If you're visiting this morning, you picked a tough day to come. <laughs> we just work our way through the Bible verse by verse and we're at one of those tough ones today. We better pray. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to teach us so that we might understand what it is you want us to learn and apply in our lives. Do a work in each and every one of us that when we leave this place, we might be different than the way we came in. We ask that in Jesus' name and all of God's people agreed by saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. So we're talking about uh, hypocrisy or humility. It is your choice. It is my choice. I was reading this week about a posh restaurant in Manhattan, New York City, and it uses hypocrisy to gather customers, capitalism at its finest. And so if I understand correctly the way it works, if a couple comes in, they're seated in a very exclusive part of the restaurant, and then they bring two menus, one given to the woman, but it's fake, and the other one given to the man. The fake one has prices 300% higher than what they cost. And the guy has the real, you know, one-third of all that stuff. And she looks at the menu, and she looks at him, and she says, Wow, he must really think I'm special. And he smiles and he says, order anything you want. And she says, this is the guy I need in my life. 
So that's a hypocrisy of what, it enters every, it's a battle. In every one of us, we all want to look good. We all want to do things to impress people. It, it, it creeps into clergy all the time. I love the story about the pastor that's walking down the street, going to work in the morning, going to the church, and he rounds the corner, and there's six little boys all in a circle. They're about 12, 13 years old, and he notices they have a dog in the middle of them, and there's a, a rope around the dog's neck. He thought they might be hurting him, so he goes up and he says, what are you kids doing? And they say, oh, it's okay, Pastor. Uh, this uh, dog we all really like. He's just a stray from the neighborhood, and we all want him, so we decided we're going to have to have a contest to find out who gets him. He said, well, what's the contest? And the kid a little sheepishly says, well, the kid that tells the biggest lie gets the dog. And the pastor goes, oh, my goodness, don't you know lying is a great sin? And he breaks into a sermon right there on the sidewalk. And it begins with, lying is a terrible sin. And it ends with, I never lied when I was your age. And the little boy looked at the dog and looked at the pastor and said, okay, you win, pastor. <laughs> the dictionary says hypocrisy is, quote, the practice of professing beliefs and feelings and virtue that you do not have, an act or instance of such falseness. Now, the dictionary calls humility this, marked by meekness or modesty in behavior, attitude, and spirit, not arrogant or prideful, being willing to be known for who you really are. Ouch. <laughs> so this battle goes on. It goes on in every human being. Our flesh, pride, the carnal part of us, wants to be noticed, wants to have esteem given to us versus the spirit in us is trying to get us to learn humility, to be real in front of other people. The problem with church is, I often hear people say, the problem with church is there's so many hypocrites. And I usually say something like, well, why don't you come? There's room for one more. The word hypocrite, the Greek word, uh, comes from the theater. That faces that Greek actors had to hold up. There wasn't any, any PA system. They were uh, outside and so to project their thoughts or what they were trying to convey, they'd hold a happy face or a sad face or whatever it is. So the word literally means one who wears a mask. So if we call someone a hypocrite, you're saying you're trying to look some way that really you have a second face behind the one that you're presenting. Hypocrites were people who had at least two or more faces, and they were actors, and thus it fits, doesn't it? So we come to an example of hypocrisy here in Acts chapter 5. Um, it is... Uh, after Jesus has returned to heaven, it is at the birth of the church, and that's really important. In fact, that is really the pivot point of why this judgment is so strong. God is trying to prevent, Jesus is trying to prevent the Pharisees from entering into the church. That's really what this whole section is about. Yes, it's about lying. Yes, it's about dishonesty. But the real issue is, if you're in the church, God doesn't want you to be a Pharisee. He would much rather you be a humble sinner that admits to your faults. In fact, it's absolutely essential. And I'm going to try and say this as many ways as I can possibly do it. That is what kills people coming to church. People who are in the church who say, I got it all together. I'm so glad that God took me into his kingdom because he knew a good thing when he saw it. And we act like we're God's gift 
to the church, to the world, to other people. Now, in this case, these folks wanted to be part of the church, they wanted to fit in, and they wanted everybody to think that they were spiritual. Now, if you were with us last week, um, there was a, another man named Barnabas who gave all that he had received from a piece of property. And they saw everybody else being impressed with that. And they thought, we want to be people of renown. We want people to think the best of us. And so that's the setup for what's going on here. Now, if we uh, go back and look at this, it sounds so strange to our 21st century ears. You know, uh, we are here looking at God killing somebody. Let's just be brutally honest. And we say, well, that doesn't sound like the love of God, does it? Well, it turns out that there's the same sort of things happening in the Old Testament too. But it always has to do with the birth of the church and worship. People becoming believers really in their heart. And so we'll look at a couple of those too. The Holy Spirit has placed this story here so that we'll understand the importance of being real, transparent with other people, willing to be known for who you really are. So if we backed up two verses to verse 36 of the last chapter, then Josie, or the same as Joseph is his given name, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, Bar is son, and so uh, Nabus is uh, encouragement, he was a, a man that we're going to watch as we go through the book of Acts because he's a, an interesting guy. He will be used more and more by, by God at, as he becomes more and more of a bridge builder between people. Um, having land, verse 37, he sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Didn't say a thing, just laid it down and walked away. So, Others are saying, wow, did you hear what Barnabas did? What a godly guy. And it seems that these, this couple, these new people, saw that and went, wow, I want to be like that. I want people to think of me that way. So this section has three parts to it. First, this major concept of hypocrisy, the first ten verses. And then this fear, what is that? Fear is reverential fear. It's God's grace for us to know who he really is and who we really are, we'll see, verse 11. And then the last section, signs and wonders. Because the church was moving in this direction, God gave great power. You look for power in your life spiritually, God talks to us about purity. It happens every time. So let's jump in and see what God might say to each one of us personally. Verse 1 starts with the word, but. <laughs> now, this great contrast. But here's the flip side. Barnabas did this, even though there were thousands of people being saved, but even though, though there was wonderful unity in the church, however, and generosity for the poor, the poor are being taken care of, but... Ananias and Sapphira. Now, their names are even interesting. Ananias literally means graciously given. Hello? <laughs> and his wife, Sapphira, in Aramaic is literally beautiful. So they were the beautiful people. They lived in North Hollywood. They drove a Lamborghini chariot. And they were, you know, just an a, attractive couple. Beautiful on the, out, on the outside, but we're going to see not so much on the inside. And they sold a possession, some land evidently, and they came to give it to the church. Now, notice that both of these instances, Barnabas and Ananias, both men, did exactly the same thing. They sold property and they gave it. The only real difference between the two is motivation. What was going on in their heart? This is 
very close to way back in Genesis when Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel, and they were to come and worship God for the first time. The beginning of worship, the birth of worship, if, if you will, on planet Earth. And so one of them is a shepherd, Abel, raises sheep, and Cain, his brother, raises crops, and uh, they each bring an offering. Now, they had been taught by their parents, Adam and Eve, they knew that God required that there would be a sacrifice, an innocent animal, blood. Wow, pastor, why blood? Because it would point, even back in Genesis, all the way to a cross on Calvary thousands of years later. There, innocent blood would take away sins, your sins and mine, forever. So they bring these two offerings, and God rejects the offering that wasn't a blood sacrifice. And, and Cain is upset about it, and God said, why is your countenance fallen? If you do good, will you not be blessed? That's God's answer to you and I. God wants to bless our life. He wants us to be successful at life. That is his desire. God is for us. He's not against us. We have this vision of God always being upset. He's not. He loves us. But wait a minute, Pastor. We're coming to a difficult part. Hang on. We'll get there. So it's an ironic truth in life. People struggle with pride. I, I have a good friend. I've known him for years. He's not a believer, but uh, he's a really nice guy. And we went to school together, so it goes all the way back to college. And uh, he's very bright, but he's very insecure. And, and I know his history. I know his family. I understand how he got that way. Parents never complimented him. Teacher, he just felt like he was a loser. But he's a very successful man. But he makes up for it. He compensates all the time. He's always name dropping. Well, I, I, I went to a concert and I saw my old friend and he'll name some musician that he knew. Or um, he, he works uh, here, so I gotta be careful. He works here in town and um, his job puts him in front of a lot of people. And, and so he's always name dropping. And it's because he doesn't feel confident in who, who God made him to be. And so he's struggling with hypocrisy all the time. Oh, he's trying to make himself look better than he is. Now, Jesus talked about that in Luke chapter 14, about coming to a dinner table. It's a parable. And uh, he said, when you are invited to a party in that day, the, the place, the seating at the table was a statement about your standing in, in society, in the culture. He said, when you come... Take the lower seat. If you take the upper seat, which means closer to the, the host, then, uh, and the host says, oh, I'm sorry, that seat is saved for someone else. Uh, would you mind taking that seat down there? No, no, a little further down. <laughs> no, 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 all the way at the very end, right by the door. Then you'll be embarrassed. So take the lower seat and then let the host move you up. So, Ananias and Sapphira are desperate for self-recognition and, and they think the way to get ahead is to toot your own horn, to, to make yourself better than you are. Promote yourself. True greatness does not come from self-promotion. True greatness comes from being others-centered, seeing other people as more important. Acts of kindness for others, lifting them up, helping others look good. Verse 2, and he kept back, Ananias, part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, kept back here, the Greek word uh, is exactly uh, embezzlement or pointing to this hypocrisy. Selling possessions and voluntarily laying at the apostles' feet 
was becoming this common practice. And they were motivated trying to get a reputation. Look at the attention Barnabas gets. We, we need to do this. But they didn't do it. They weren't healthy. They were struggling. They didn't give what they said they were given, and that's important. It's not because they didn't give enough. That's not what this is about at all. It's not even because they lied. It's because they were becoming hypocrites, and if God didn't stop them, they would be in a position in the church where others would look at their life outside of church and go, if that's a Christian, why would I go to that church? Sound familiar? Verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Heart is always the problem. What goes on in our heart? Scripture has a lot to say about our hearts, and none of, none of it's very good. Hearts make us self-centered, Scripture says. And I'll give you three. Self-centered, easily deceived, our own heart, and tend to help us rationalize sin. That's what scripture says about my own heart. Follow your heart? I don't think so. Not a very good idea. So our hearts are naturally self-centered. Listen, Proverbs 27, 19. As in face, excuse me, as in water, face reflects face like a mirror. So a man's heart reveals the man. The heart naturally gives us tunnel vision. It, it wants to put me in the center of the universe. My heart does. Your heart too. My heart naturally reflects me and the opinions and my desires that I have. And I start to impose them upon myself. My heart naturally reflects me like a mirror or like water in you. We can develop other-centeredness, but it isn't easy because it starts when you were born, the opposite direction. What? Yes, when you were born, when I was born, I'll use myself as an example, and I get home and I'm uh, hungry, I scream. <laughs> and mom shows up and everything's taken care of. And now I'm pretty quick, so... If I'm too hot, I scream, mom shows up. If I'm too cold, I scream, mom or dad shows up. If I'm uncomfortable because my diapers are carrying a load, I scream. The problem is there are people 60, 70, 80 years old that are still screaming. I want it my way. We can have it anyway as long as it's the way that I desire it. So we are naturally self-centered, and we build it into our children. Secondly, Scripture teaches that our hearts are easily fooled by emotions. Jeremiah 17.9, my heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Well, maybe your heart, Pastor, mine is pure like driven snow. That's not what Scripture says. Now, Musicians who are songwriters, lyricists, they understand this. Uh, the, the 80s group, some of you are old enough to remember Journey, they had a, a big hit, Foolish Heart. Foolish Heart, hear me calling. Stop before you start falling. Foolish Heart, heed my warning. You've been wrong before, don't be wrong anymore. Oh yeah, like that's going to happen. I'll just change my feelings about it and then my heart will be okay. Number one, our hearts are easily, are, excuse me, are self-centered. Number two, easily fooled. Number three, they tend to rationalize our sin. It wasn't my fault. It was my second grade teacher. So Proverbs 21 says, every man, every woman, the way, of every man and woman is right in their own eyes. But the Lord weighs the hearts. The own, our own view of ourselves is unreliable. That's what this is saying. Deceitfully wicked, we read about in Jeremiah, desperately. Who can know it? God says, 
I search the hearts. I test mine, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Only when we measure our motives, because that's really what this is talking about, what our motive is, against what God's word says, we start seeing that there's some real problems in our lives. You have not lied to man, but you've lied to God, he says. And uh, they're living in our life as though there wasn't a God watching. And most people, I would say, do that. They think, well, you know, God's not watching, and if I just fake it, I can make it. (laughs) Now, the minute I say the word politicians, you go, oh, no, he's going there. I'm not going there. I'm just going to make a, a blanket statement. Politicians lie. (laughs) What? Could that be possible? And they, a leader can lie for years, but have you noticed they never admit that they lied? They never come to grips with their own heart's view of themselves. This is very instructive for you and I, because we're all wired the same way. So, We like to think that we get away with it. And not just politicians. Let me pick on pastors a minute. Pastors do it just like everybody else. That's why I told that joke at the beginning. My heart is just as deceitfully wicked as yours. Oh, my goodness. I knew we were in the wrong church, Murray. Let's go somewhere else. (laughs) Now, maybe you haven't yet grasped what Scripture says about your heart and my heart. That all have sinned. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You sin, your spouse sins, your kids sin, your political party leaders sin, you sin, and your pastor sins, okay? The problem is with all of us is our hearts keep ignoring the things that God said. Okay, so... If you doubt that, here's the scripture. 1 John 1, 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If you say you don't have any sin. We'd all like to think, you know what? I went last week without sinning at all. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You see... God's law is so constricting that nobody keeps it. I I hear it from people, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. I don't always say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Nobody keeps it. You've never coveted, you never went down the freeway and looked at a a new car or whatever and say, oh, I, I really would like that. Now, that's a problem, but there's another whole area of sin that we like to ignore. And and that Jesus talked about that. He says, if you look after a person, the lust after them, it's the same as having sex with them. If you hate your brother, you've murdered him. Oh, Pastor, that sounds a little extreme. I didn't say it. That's what Jesus is saying. And so the, the standard's getting real high. It's higher than that. There's a third area of sin that nobody handles. How so? There are sins of commission. You did it on purpose or by accident. But there are sins of omission. You just left it out. And we don't have time to go through all those. I'll just say, love your neighbor as yourself. How are you doing with that one? You buy your neighbors the same amount of stuff you buy yourself? I don't think so. You love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength always, all the time? Those are sins of omission. So I'm trying to convince you, you're a sinner. Outward sins, inward sins, and then these sins that you fail to do that maybe you don't even know they're there in the book. But you keep studying and you'll find a big list. Can we move on, Pastor? Yes, we can. Verse 4. While it remain, was it not your own? This is a very important verse. The property... It's a critical part of it, actually. The Bible condones ownership. There's absolutely nothing wrong with people owning things. 
while it was yours, it was yours, right? And after it was sold, it was still yours to do with whatever you wanted with the money. Why have you conceived this thing? You could have taken the money and not given a penny. You could have given 10%. You could have given 50%. You could have given all of it. It doesn't make you more holy. It was their choice. The property, the money from the sale, was theirs to do with. That's really important. Now, this is where many pastors will jump off and talk about tithing. I'm not going there. It's just the opposite. I want you to see that God condones capitalism. What? You can own stuff. That's okay. Well, I, you were talking about giving everything away. No, no, the early church was giving everything away because they had gathered together after Pentecost and there were people from all over the Roman Empire who were there in Jerusalem, didn't have a place to stay. So the church took them in. It's a very unique time, a very short time in history. But God would then send them all out after the believers had shared their properties and invited them in to live with them, and it would change the world. They would go out to the entire Roman Empire. Most of us in this room are the result of people having left Jerusalem and gone to Spain, gone to England, gone to Europe, and then come over our relatives to the United States and it's because of this great country that we can gather together and say insulting things about the country. That's the beauty of the freedom that we have, okay? So, then Ananias, hearing these words, verse five, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. I, I think even Peter is surprised what would happen. Now, if you're studying this story for the first time, you're probably thinking, Pastor, this sounds a little bit severe, don't you think? I mean, isn't the death penalty a little over the top for fibbing? No, no, he didn't fib. He's trying to be a hypocrite, and that's the whole point. Well, hypocrites are the problem and the sin that God is trying to stop. I see it happening all the time in this church. Now, aren't you, people say to me, I'd like to have a church like the book of Acts. Are you sure? I don't think so. You know, you're trying to come to church with the kids and they're taking forever, they won't eat their breakfast, and their hairs are all a mess, and you get them in the back of the car, mom, and you're screaming at them, I told you to fix your hair, look at him here, and you're fighting, and you pull in the driveway, and you come up to the front door, and there's an usher there, and he says, good morning, how are you? And you say, praise the Lord. <laughs> and then you die, oh, die right there on the spot, if it's the book of Acts. Uh, the song service, right? We, we sang last week, I surrender all. Really? And we sing, I surrender all. And look over here and two people drop over dead. Yeah, three here, six here, two more, one more over there. If we were in the New Testament church of the book of Acts, we'd have to have a line of hearses out there every Sunday to take the bodies to the cemetery. That's why cemeteries were right next to early churches, you realize? <laughs> the lesson is hypocrisy kills. That's what this is saying. Look at verse 6. These young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. This is the first youth ministry in the church. <laughs> the next verse is even better. Now, it was about three hours later when his wife came in. Really, ladies, three hours late for church? And notice, not knowing what had happened. She was shopping. She had no idea what happened. She comes to church three hours late, and Peter stops her and says, verse 8, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Pause. This is Peter's offer of a moment of grace undeserved favor with God. All she had to say was, you know, my husband Ananias wanted me to say we gave all the money, but 
but we really didn't. Is that okay? Peter said, of course it's okay. She missed her moment of grace. And so Peter offers it, but it doesn't happen. Yes, the property was theirs to do what they wanted, but they were wanting to look better than they were and lead the entire church astray into being a Pharisee. And I mentioned there's a couple of places in the Old Testament this happens too. In the book of Leviticus chapter 10, the, the church is, or the Old Testament is, is meeting at the tabernacle. And uh, the, the priest, Levi, has two sons, a Benadad and a Bihu. And, uh, and they're, they're bad news. And uh, they're in all kinds of trouble, morally and ethically. And so at the service, they decide to light their own censers. You know, so they take a censer and they go over and take some fire out of, a, of just a cook fire. Well, God had a very prescribed way to worship him and had to be things set aside because he wanted them to understand that he was holy and they're not. So they just took the fire, put it in the censer, and then they went out and they danced in front of the, of the tabernacle. And God smote them, boom, on the spot. Two dead boys, and they buried them. That's not the only one. Second story is in Second Samuel chapter 6. King David is taking the, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and, and he's wanting to take it up to Jerusalem for the first time. Again, this is the birth of worship in Jerusalem. And God's trying to set a standard. And so he's already laid out, you're to take the ark only through the, the, the rings, the stays that were on the side of it, and put two poles through it, and six priests were to carry it on their shoulders. And they're to go up to Kiran Jairus, the city they're going to. And they're leaving the Philistines where they had captured it and kept it. And so they have to go uphill. And the priest didn't want to walk that far. Well, the point was that you're serving the Lord, and they were supposed to display that. So it was on an ox cart. So they said, oh, just leave it on the cart. Throw it in the back of the truck. We'll drive up there. And they don't have any priests involved. Like God said, six priests carrying it. And so they put this young guy. He's just trying to be helpful. His name's Uzzah. And he's going up alongside this rockety road, and, and the ark starts to tip and starts to fall over, and he does the normal thing. He reaches up and touches it. Dead man. He touched the ark of the covenant. My goodness. Peter said, how is it that you have agreed together, the word is symphonia in the Greek language, it's a symphony, you and your husband, to test the spirit of the Lord. You want to test God, see if he's really involved in this? Look, the feet of those who bury your husband are at the door, and they'll carry you out. <laughs> Evidently, she walked in at the same time the first youth ministry is coming back from the cemetery. And immediately she fell down, verse 10, at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and thought, this is not a healthy place to be. And they carried her out and buried her next to her husband. So, why does this occur? Why is this so severe? It's the timing of the church. God is saying, I don't want people who are Pharisees filtering into the church. Because Jerusalem was filled with them, right? Jesus was always struggling with the Pharisees. They would criticize him. And he would finally, every once in a while, he'd just pop and he said, you whitewashed sepulchers. You look pretty white on the outside, but inside you have dead men's bones. You brood of vipers. This is what he's saying to the, the most religious group in Jerusalem. The ones that looked real good on the outside, got the white flowing robes and they're pious. And, and you think, well... I can never be that good. The point. They weren't either. But they weren't letting on to that. So people thought that and the relationship with God was unattainable. You remember Jesus is, is constantly running up against that. He's having dinner at Simon the, the Pharisee's house. And, uh, and they're sitting at this table that's low. And he's got his feet out. And this woman comes in who's a prostitute. And she comes in and she has heard the gospel 
And she stands by Jesus and she starts to weep in his presence. And you would too. And Simon, the host, is sitting there with his arms crossed and he watches the tears coming off her onto Jesus' feet. She gets down on her knees, lets out her hair, and uses her hair to dry his feet off. Simon the Pharisee, the hypocrite, says, if he was who he said he is, he would know that she is a wanton woman. Guess what? He did know that. And he allowed her to do that because he saw that she was in the middle of repentance and receiving him. The woman caught in adultery. They're all ready to kill her. And he says, go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. Because he knew what he was about to do on a cross for your sins and for mine. It's the same thing. Great fear, great humility came upon them. Listen, Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledge my sin, King David says. I acknowledge my sin and my iniquity I have not hidden. I'm wide open about it, Lord. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 15, excuse me, 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. There it is. It's the heart, it's the motive. These, O Lord, you will not despise. A bent knee and a tear-stained eye he never rejects. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. Jesus, I need your help. All who call upon him in truth. I'm a sinner, Lord, but come. Isaiah 57, 15, I dwell in the high and holy place with him, who has a contrite and humble spirit. He has shown you, O man, Micah 6, shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly and love mercy and walk humbly by his side. Hypocrisy or humility, what is it? The first Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit who recognize that they're bankrupt. Those who understand they don't have anything good spiritually to offer God, but he takes us anyway because he loves us. Humility, poverty of spirit. God always accepts those who come broken. Now, this is the first mention of the word church in the New Testament. Ekklesia, the Greek word, the people, so important. We've lost that meaning today. We think of it as the building or the denomination or, or that other building over there across town. It's you, it's me. And the church is so important that God says we need to be real. So the world can look at us and see that we're not being phony. Hey, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Let me tell you about God's grace. So that they understand that they have hope. That they can come to God and he might receive them too. It's not because you have great breeding, because you grew up in this certain church, because you went and studied the Bible, because you you just don't earn it. It's grace. It's unmerited favor that God will give to anyone who will humble themselves. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. Oh my goodness, where did the time go? Tough story. God seemed to be over the top here. No, no. He wants people to get saved. And he doesn't want another whole new group of New Testament Pharisees. He wants you and I to be absolutely transparent with people. We need to confess that without him, we would be doing the same things we used to do. Let me say that. I, if the Holy Spirit pulled out today, tomorrow I'd be doing the same sins that I did 45 years ago. Yes, it's been that long. You think I'd be further along. Sorry. 
but that's why I'm here. So you look at me and go, that guy's a jerk. Maybe God will take me. I'm kind of a jerk too sometimes. We just need to fess up, church. We need to admit to other people so that they see that we have faults and that we're not perfect and God didn't take us into his kingdom because we were so amazing. True story. Two guys in this church, I know them really, really well. They uh, were on the Jesus Video Project. Some of you may not even know that. It's in the bulletin, but we've been giving out Jesus videos in this valley for years. We just... It's, you know, it's the story of Jesus. At first it was videotapes and now it's, uh, you know, compact discs and, and they go house to house. So these two guys go just down the street and uh, it's a Monday night. Nobody else was out. They decided to go out. They had some time and uh, they go to a uh, gated community down the street. And uh, there's a guard there and they, they walk up with, grocery bags full of compact discs, and he said, what are you guys doing? And he said, well, we're, we're giving out these videos. He said, let me see one. He looks at it and he says, oh, Jesus video. Yeah, I, I actually saw this. this is a good, good movie. And he said, what are you, what are you gonna do with them? He said, we're gonna give them to everybody in the apartment complex that wants them. He said, okay, go do it. But make sure you get the last guy on the top floor, Bruce. He's a mess. And they go, okay. So they get permission. They're working their way down. And then one of them stops and says to the other, you know what? I, I think we need to go up and see Bruce first, the guy on the end. And the other guy said, you know, I was just thinking the same thing. And so they go upstairs to the last door all the way down, and they knock on the door. Silence. Nothing. One says to the other, well, let, let's try a little harder. Still nothing. They start to walk away. And one says, you know what? I, I think I need to be really obvious. So he walks up and flat-handed. And the door flings open with a guy with no shirt on carrying a 45 saying, what do you want? And they said, uh, we're here giving out these videos. Videos? What's it about? Uh, it's about Jesus. Really? Come inside. And one turned to the other and said, this is where we die. <laughs> and they went in, he sits on the couch, takes his 45 and puts it on the coffee table in front of the two of them. He says, now what's this video? And they explain. And they Jesus died for your sins. And it's the way out of the pain that you're in. And the guy dissolves in tears. And he's a big moose of a guy. And he's weeping. His shoulders are going up and down. And he said, what is it? And he said, I was sitting here with that 45 in my mouth a minute before you knocked on the door. And I said, God, if you can send somebody to help me, and I need it. And you went... And for four hours, they read the scriptures to him and prayed with him, and he's still in this church today. Good place to stop. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you that you'll take anybody and that you love us and you desire for us to spend eternity with you. We thank you that just you want us to be real, to be transparent, who we really are. Thank you for reminding us with this abrupt story that we see that that's how much you love the world, that you want authentic people to tell them about Jesus who are living it. And Lord, we pray for anybody here this morning that's not walking with you and ask that you would speak to them right now and save them. Christians, please pray. I don't know who might be here. Maybe you're here for the first time or maybe you've been here before. But God has been speaking to you about your sins. You know you're a sinner. Nobody has to tell you that. If you'd like to get rid of those sins, if you'd like to be freed from them, if you'd like to be a new person, a new creature in Christ, if you'd like to surrender to him, would you let me know you want to 
by raising your hand and looking up at me. And I'll just recognize it. I won't embarrass you. God bless you. Right in front of me, two of you, God bless you. Very back row with your hand up high, God bless you. Couple right here. Behind the sound booth, one, two, three of you, God bless you here. Anyone over here? Yes, God bless you. And you? And you? Now, if I miss your hand, don't worry, God doesn't. But those of you that raise your hands, would you please pray out loud with the rest of us? We're just going to ask God to forgive our sins and we'll do it with you to make it easy. So everybody, please say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give you my life. Please forgive my sins. In Jesus' name, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Those of you that raised your hands, we would encourage you to go over to these double doors to your left, to my right. Some of our elders are there. We'd love to give you a Bible, pray with you. If you need prayer for anything, go there to the rest. God bless you. Give somebody a hug before you go home. Pastor Rick tonight, 630.